Welcome to Discovering, and welcome to the first day of spring. And it certainly does feel like it because it's raining on me right now. Tonight on Discovering, we have a few different stories for you. First, Cody Cass takes a look at the upcoming blue spotted salamander migration in Marquette. Also to be able to understand more about the times that they're crossing, um, the weather conditions. And then we go to Autrain for a fish habitat enhancement project. Try to mimic natural functioning shorelines. And then we learn to clean with snow. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night and it's time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan What defines spring in the UP? Some people stand by the first robin, leaves budding, or seeing migratory birds make their way back after a long winter away. For some, it's when the salamanders start migrating. A somewhat unique event, Presque Island Marquette is home to one of the most notable blue spotted salamander migrations. These salamanders will journey from the leaf litter within the city parks and head down to the lowland bogs every spring to start the next generation of salamanders. Like frogs, salamanders are amphibians, so they need water to reproduce. Once they reach the adult stage, they each go on their own journey to explore life outside the bog. Much more qualified to talk salamanders than me, Dr. Jill Leonard is head of biology at Northern Michigan University and has been spearheading research efforts to better understand the salamander migration. We get started with the Blue Spotted Salamander Project actually because of an amazing undergraduate that worked with me a few years back. So Eli Bieri um, was a sophomore looking for a new project and he was passionate about herpetology and particularly amphibians. Um, and so we were looking for some projects for him and somebody mentioned that they had seen migrating salamanders on Presque Isle here in Marquette um, and that they were concerned that there were some roadkill issues and that this might be an interesting project for a young student to work on. So uh, Eli grabbed onto that, did some research and we went out and did a project where we evaluated uh, the number of salamanders that were crossing, a little bit about the timing and then also just tried to understand if uh, there were, really were car mortalities. Um, Presque Isle is a city park and it has a road that encircles it. And so it's not a high traffic area and part of it is closed all winter anyway, but the section that we were concerned with um, is open in the winter time. And so um, we were trying to figure out if there were really any, if was anybody going out there in April in, in Marquette in the UP? Um, and it turns out they were. And so that project, we um, were able to document well over 400 salamanders getting killed. Um, we were also able to do a little bit of basic population estimation to figure out that, you know, we might be seeing as much as 20% of the salamanders that are crossing the road were getting hit by cars. And so that was pretty significant. Um, so Eli continued on um, and started working with the Superior Watershed Partnership and um, the Presque Isle Advisory Group uh, and took this to the city and asked for a road closure just during the period where we thought that the salamanders were migrating. Northern Michigan University is cooperating with the Superior Watershed Partnership to do a citizen science survey of the salamanders. So we're interested in having the public come and help us count salamanders on the road. Um, the idea here is um, the public are there all the time and so um, we can get sort of rolling surveys all the time for the number of salamanders that are there. Um, we'll be using that data to do some indexing of the population, not exact population size, but sort of a relative population. Um, 
and then also to be able to understand more about the times that they're crossing, um, the weather conditions, those kinds of things. Um, Northerns also has a group of students that are out there as well that are going to be sort of backstopping the citizen science um, and collecting data. And so we can really understand how citizen science can help us in applications like this. If you're interested in seeing the salamanders, be sure to use an actual light source. Using cell phone flashlights aren't as effective, leading to accidental salamander fatalities. It is easiest to see salamanders on the pavement and on snow. Going off the road will increase chances of them being stepped on. Touching salamanders can cause stress and also wipe away their protective barrier to fight disease and stay moist. If you've ever fished from shore on a backwoods lake, you know the best fishing spots are those with trees sticking out of the water. They're also the worst spots to snag on a branch or a fish takes your hook for a swim around a giant log. But that woody debris is important habitat for fish to feed and shelter and it also keeps the lake healthy. Now when we build houses and resorts along a lake, and honestly who doesn't want a beautiful piece of lakefront property here in the UP? We often remove that woody structure as the shorelines are developed, leading to poor lakeshore habitat for both fish and wildlife. On a natural, undeveloped lake, you can find up to 600 to 800 dead trees per mile of shoreline. On lakes like Autrain Lake, the number of submerged trees per mile is only 22, according to a DNR survey. That same DNR survey in 2017 showed that the fish species in Autrain Lake we're growing at a much slower rate than the statewide average. And that brings us to today, a habitat enhancement project on Autrain Lake. Corey Kovacs, fisheries biologist with the Michigan DNR. I manage waters in the Eastern Lake Spear Management Unit, which includes Autrain Lake, which is where we're at today. Today, we're working with our Elder Conservation District and UPRC and D folks of the Eastern Upper Peninsula to install fish habitat structures on Autrain Lake. So we're putting these along the shoreline for the benefit of early life stages of fish, as well as a lot of terrestrial animals as well, and reptiles and amphibians. So this was a project that was on a high priority project list for the Michigan DNR Fish Division, and it was funded through the Fisheries Habitat Grant. So Elder Conservation District was awarded funding for us to install these fish habitat structures to benefit the ecosystem within Autrain Lake. We worked with individual landowners for the permit application process to secure this project and in individual landowners' properties. So obtaining that authorization allowed us to do fish sticks and brush bundles. So today we work with partners and we work with volunteers to install or put those along the shorelines on Autrain Lake so the fish and our reptiles and amphibian friends can benefit from that. So this type of project along the shoreline, which has been developed for more than 100 years, if you believe that, and with the, the development that has been in place for so long, we know a lot of that woody material has been removed just through the use, just over, over that time. But with the fish community here, we knew that it would benefit from any kind of installation of coarse woody debris or trees or slash or treetops, brush. So with us in, insta installing that near shore, we can definitely benefit the fish community that does exist here. So we anticipate that the yellow perch community, northern pike, and walleye, which are all associated and related through different life stages um, as they're growing and pre preying and predation through each other, we feel as though the fish structures that we have in the lake will benefit those fish communities accordingly. My name is Matt Watkes, and I am the Alger Conservation District Manager. And we are here today as part of a outreach, education, and work day for the public to be invited to come out here and take part in this awesome project that we have going on here at Autrain Lake. Well, it's all about partnership as well, and that's how this started with a few conversations with DNR fisheries biologists and with UPRC and D out of Sault Ste. Marie. And this was all based on fisheries uh, reports that were put together by biologists with the DNR. And it's, it started to show that there was a, a decline in fish populations in Autrain Lake. And we wanted to try and address that with some practices to introduce more coarse woody debris into the lake. So in these discussions we had, we started looking into grants and funding opportunities to get this work done. So we put our heads together and about a year and a half ago, we applied for a fisheries habitat grant through the DNR. And we were subsequently awarded that uh, late last fall. 
And that provided us the workforce and of course the funding to uh, get everything put together, reach out to all the landowners on the lake and ask for some participation. So that was the big start. And we're hosting this here at Northern Knights Resort on Autrain Lake. These owners have been spectacular in helping us out, uh, not only with the space, the use of some of their equipment and their um, uh, materials. And we really want to give a great shout out to Northern Knights Resort as well. And the whole idea here is to try to mimic natural functioning shorelines. So if we didn't have a parcel here of land and we weren't clearing dead trees, those trees would die and fall into the lake. And since humans are here and clean things up, that just isn't happening. So we're trying to just mimic some of those uh, uh, natural processes as best as we can and where it fits. Now we weren't trying to take away anything from recreational opportunities or the use of people's property. We were just trying to make this project fit in with the landowner's goals and also the, where they are and what materials might be available. So we were looking for larger trees along the shoreline that we could potentially drop into the water and those create what we call fish sticks. And it's just habitat for fish cover for them, places where those uh, bottom of the food chain organisms can start to grow and provide uh, space for those young fish. Like I mentioned, we were looking for landowner participation. When people reached out to us and said that they would like to be included, we performed site visits at each location to see if it would be a good fit. And I'll be honest, there was a couple where it wasn't a good fit. It just didn't have the right material on hand or the shoreline was all sandy and very shallow but we did have about 25% of the landowners on the lake that agreed to participate and that it was a good fit. We also had permission from the US Forest Service, which owns a lot of the Western shoreline behind me and Alger County Road Commission, which has a short stretch of land on the Northwest corner where there was a lot of dead ash and elm trees anyways. And we helped out the Road Commission by keeping those trees from falling in the road. We fall felled them into the lake instead. We're also incorporating brush bundles into the project that we're sinking out in open water eventually. But today was just about putting all these brush bundles together and staging material and getting ready to drop them in, in the water afterwards. All but one brush bundle was built on shore to be moved into the water at a later date. This one is being put along the road, not in front of private property, so it was able to be built on the ice. Nice and wide, so that's the base. The big logs are the foundation, so they'll, they'll decay over time the slowest, and so the brush bundle will stay in its shape longer because it's not sitting right on the bottom. It won't get covered in silt or sand. So we want to be able to create room as it settles so that there's areas for the fish to be able to get in between so they can use it for cover. And then as it settles over time, there'll be aquatic insects that use it, so the fish will be able to feed in there too. Um, and then bigger fish will be able to feed on the ecosystem from the smaller fish that are hiding in our brush bundles. My name is Sean McKeon. I'm the Education Director for Michigan United Conservation Clubs. So MUCC runs an on-the-ground program. We do habitat projects like this all over the state of Michigan, between 20 and 30 every year. Sometimes it's fish habitat, sometimes it's rabbit habitat for small game. We do wood duck boxes, and we rely on volunteers to help us and the Michigan DNR get work done all over the state. So we did the registration, we helped with some of the initial planning, and then we're here on site to, to help get the work done. So we have 27, 28 people out here today. Um, and we've put in, we've built, I think, 10 brush bundles and we have some ready to go into the lake. And then we've dropped almost 60 fish sticks around the lake today too. So pretty good productive work day. Some of the volunteers today brought their skills and knowledge from similar projects downstate. So Craig Keevey, Natural Shorelines Forever. I, I think it's hands-on conservation. There's a lot of talk about what to do environmentally and that sort of thing. And then there's infighting about what to do, but there's no substitute for going out to these projects hands-on and actually doing something. It makes you feel wonderful and like you really are doing something. And then to see the evidence later that, that these things really made a difference. And we did an, a natural shoreland restoration on Portage Lake in Pinckney, Michigan, uh, 2,700 feet 
uh, shoreline, 52 structures, wood structures we put in the water along the shoreline. Part of the goal of that was to provide information based on the mistakes we made and the improvements to the process and ways to do it better. And we provided that in a document and we provided it to the people here at, at doing the Aw Train Lake project. So we're really honored that they took some of the lessons learned and we're just excited to be back here because we have seen the evidence of what happens when these structures are in the water and the explosion of life where there wasn't any before. So for us, it's very personal. We're very satisfied to be here and be part of this project. And we're really grateful to the people who put this all together. So as soon as we see some open water, we're gonna try and get out there and move some of these brush bundles. Utilizing the pontoon deck that the owner here has that brush bundles were built on and also utilizing some open flat bow boats from the DNR and US Forest Service. So as soon as we can coordinate that and have some open ice, we'll be back on the water moving these brush bundles around. And we still have a few more to build. I'd say the project after today is about 60 to 70% complete. We'll be out here all summer. If you see us, please stop, ask questions, or participate if you can. The calendar says today is spring, but we know here in the UP that spring doesn't start for a little bit yet. But if you're itching to do a little bit of spring cleaning already, there are a few ways the snow can help you do so. I visited with Jim Curdy up in the Keweenaw and he shows us a couple ways to clean with snow. This is the way my mother and grandmother used to clean big rugs, especially like this one, it's made out of wool, so you don't really want it wet. It was the best way to clean them was in the snow in the winter. So first you put it down and then you beat it like you'd beat a carpet otherwise. Use both the benefit of the snow acting as an agent to help remove dirt particles, but also about taking out the odors. It's actually a very simple process but it does a really good job for these large carpets that you can't put into a washing machine. Sweep it off. The snow starts to pick up the dirt. After you've done that, then you flip it over. And if your carpet's really dirty, you'd see the dirt in the snow. People would also do this even with rag rugs. So the important thing is that the carpet has to be outdoors for quite a while. This one I put out last night, put it on my front porch and let it get cold before it's exposed to the snow so that it, the warmth of the carpet doesn't start melting the snow and get the carpet wet. Even like a sunny day, the, the carpet will start to absorb sunlight so this is the perfect day for doing this you get snow on the top and the bottom both and then leave it there for quite a while what that does it it makes the carpet nice and fresh so when you bring it in the house you can smell the outdoors which makes it real nice people would also take care of stuff like you know the old-fashioned hunting clothes those heavy wool pants and jacket They'd bury those in the snow to help make them fresh. Brush them with a brush. Takes off the, if it's just surface dirt, and that makes it nice and fresh. If you have something that's musty, smoky, the snow is a very good place to, to uh, get rid of those smells. You might have to leave it for a while, but. But then after the carpet's been sitting out for a while, you begin to brush it. Oh, I would uh, typically leave this out for a couple hours. There'll be a little residual moisture in the carpet, but in the winter time, typical UP home is gonna be very dry anyway. It dries off very fast. If I were to do the whole carpet, sweep the entire carpet, fold it in half, sweep the top half again, fold it another time, sweep. And by the end, you just have a small strip that you have to concern yourself with. And when you clean it with the snow, the colors become quite bright again, I think. A challenge in the winter is trying to keep your garage floor clean. And if you just go like this, you see that there's always that trail of muck and snow and dirt. But if you just introduce some nice, fresh, dry snow to it, all that um, 
the dirt gets picked up by the snow. And very soon you have, except for a little bit ice, but the floor is clear. Snow is free. It's environmentally safe, of course. And in quick order, you can get all that mud and dirt cleared away. So you can see how quickly I did half of where the vehicle was parked and it's nice, it's dry. So all you really need is a push broom and some fresh snow. That's all for tonight, and I hope to see you right back here next week for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.